An arrow function lets us write shorter code, but they can also seem a lot more complex. They're actually quite easy though, uh, but if you're just looking at code and you've never really seen an arrow function, they seem super scary. They don't have to be though. And so we could write const hello is equal to a function return hello Caleb, and then we could execute hello. So const greeting is equal to hello console.log greeting. And what we're going to see here, hello Caleb. That's a standard function. Actually, this is an anonymous function. We've assigned it to const hello. We can also do function hello, execute this function, and store it in a different variable. Two ways of doing the exact same thing. When I refresh, it says the exact same thing. And so this is a typical function. So another way of writing this could be const, could be const hello is equal to brackets arrow and that. And so essentially what we've done here is function hello is equal to something like that. This is the old way of doing it. The new way of doing it is const hello brackets arrow console.log hello hello and we could type hello and execute it and it's going to say and it's and it's going to say hello okay that's one way of writing it there's another way of writing it we can actually make this a lot shorter and in fact we could simply do const hello is equal to opening and closing curly brace uh, not curly braces but parentheses an arrow and then in a normal function we use the return keyword we use the return of the king keyword. To be on a single line, we can just say this is going to execute some sort of function. And so this could say uh, return hello from one line function. Now let's go ahead and execute hello. And that's not going to do anything because I needed to console log it, but let's shortcut that and let's just run hello. And it returns. And so all this is doing is doing some sort of logic. In this case, we're just returning a string and storing it in const hello. Then we can run it as if it were a function. Now let's look at some of the syntax here because I went kind of fast. So let's do const my new greeting is equal to, let's take a parameter, name, arrow, and then I can do console.log and we can use a template literal in here and we can say welcome name. And remember template literals need those back literals need those back ticks otherwise your variables aren't going to work. And so now I can use my new greeting coding for everybody.com. Welcome coding for everybody.com or welcome Caleb. And all this is doing is saying, "Hey, if there were no parameters, you don't need to add any parameters in there whatsoever. But if you do have a parameter, throw it inside of those, uh, not curly braces, but your parentheses. If you have a second parameter, it's just comma, second parameter, and so on and so on and so on. And you can work with those in here. Now in our example here, we really only have one line of code. What do we want it to do? Let's go ahead and get rid of these curly braces because it's only executing that one line of code. Make that just a touch smaller here. And so my new greeting is equal to, it's going to take some sort of name and it's not going to return anything per se, but it is in fact going to console log welcome. So this is going to work the exact same way. So if I go here, clear that and refresh, it says welcome Caleb. Every time I refresh, it says welcome Caleb. And just to really make sure that this is working and it's not cached, Caleb123123123123321. And so that's working as expected. So as a quick comparison, you're going to see function, my function name, maybe it takes a parameter, does a thing in here. You can also do const anonymous function is equal to a function, do a thing in here. This can also take a name. And this is pretty common. You'll see this a lot in modern JavaScript as well. We also have arrow functions. So you could say const arrow func one is equal to takes no parameters, do a thing, 
So if you've got multiple lines, you multiple lines, you can do multiple lines in here. So multiple lines. This will also be able to take a parameter or more. These can all take more than one parameter. Or if it's only doing one line of code, you can do const arrow func two is equal to if you have no parameters, no parameters. If you have a parameter, you can throw it between those parentheses, arrow, and then whatever you're going to return or whatever you want to do in one line. So these are the two older ways of doing it. And there's a reason we do it this way still. Uh, and these are the two newer ways. And so the idea here is that when you use the word function, the this keyword exists. So like we saw in the last lesson where we did this dot name, that exists. Now it also exists inside of an arrow function. The difference is when you use the, the keyword this, and I'm saying T-H-I-S, is this in this circumstance and this circumstance here, these two, it's referring to this as an entire object. So it thinks that's an object, it thinks that's an object. The this keyword, it still exists here, but it's not referring to this object. It's referring to the outer object. So maybe it's wrapped in a function. Maybe it's wrapped in an object. Maybe it isn't wrapped in anything and it's referring to the entire window itself, the whole global scope of your JavaScript ecosystem. And so one is localized, so this is smaller, and this one is using everything globally, everything it can get its hands on. That is the main difference. Now, if you're not using the this keyword inside of your function, I would highly recommend just using an arrow function. It's more performant. Your JavaScript doesn't need to think about as much. You can write bigger applications that aren't going to crash or slow down your browser better. It's also more modern and employers are going to like to see that you can actually write this kind of code. Now, what I want you to do, and this is, should take a few minutes, should probably take 10, 15 minutes. I want you to write the four different types of, to write the four different types of functions here. A normal function, an anonymous function, an arrow function with multiple lines, and an arrow function with just one line of code. And then I want you to execute each of them. Make sure that they work. This is really, really important. This is vital to being able to get a job as a modern JavaScript developer. Go ahead. Classes are a lot like standard objects, but they're written in a more friendly way. In fact, you can think of this as two different ways to basically write the same set of code. And then classes can get significantly more advanced and more developer friendly, actually. So a class is really just another way of writing another object. And if that's the case, why have two ways of writing objects? If we have one way that works, why use a new way? And in modern JavaScript, you're going to see people using classes all the time. This is a very common thing these days. So while they are very similar, they actually, they being classes, have better features, like being able to write one class and merge it into another class with this thing called subclassing or extending. You can also write the same method twice and have it execute on both of them quite easily without overwriting them. And classes just look easier to read. Classes are also cleaner to write. You'll see a lot of these in production level code bases. Plus they look a lot like PHP and Python classes, which means now at this point you're learning augmented programming, which means once you learn this lesson, you are basically getting experience learning Python, PHP, Java, C, all these other OOP languages you're getting hands-on experience with by learning it in JavaScript. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. So a class starts with a keyword class, and then it has some sort of name. Now, often you'll see a class actually doesn't follow camel casing. It follows just normal casing. So it could be my class name follows standard uppercase naming conventions like that. Not all the time, but you will see it a lot like this. And so you say my class name is equal to well, it's not actually equal to anything because we're not assigning anything. We're saying my class name, curly braces. And then we can put object literals in here. So we could say something like speak console.log. Woof, woof. And so this is the bare bones of a class. Now to instantiate a class, which is a fancy word for saying how to activate your class, you could say const thing, whatever you want to name it, is equal to new my class name. And we saw this in the date lesson where we did new date and then we put the year, month, and day. And at this point, we can say thing dot speak. So at this point, this code right here looks a lot like a standard object. So let's go ahead and save this and refresh our page. And it says woof woof. And so what it's doing here is saying, 
all this code, jam it into this particular variable, this const called thing. And because it has a method in here called speak, we can do thing.speak. Now where this gets a little more powerful is we can do something like set name, and then it's going to take some sort of name, and we can say this.name is equal to the name. Now this might seem a little weird, a little convoluted even, but what we're going to, what we're going to do here is use set name, set the name to whatever it is, and because we're using this, that stands for this entire object, that's what it represents, we can now say in this particular method or this function speak, we can access it with this dot name. And we can say woof woof says the dog named this dot name. And this needs to be a template literal, otherwise we cannot use that. So now we can say thing dot set name doggo. And what that's going to do is set the name doggo. And so if we say create a new thing class, a new thing object, set that name, this dot name is going to be whatever the name is in this parameter, so it's going to be doggo. And then we say thing dot speak, speak. We can now access this dot name from set name. And there's actually an easier way to do this. Uh, we'll talk about this in the next lesson. But this is a good example of using the this keyword inside of a class. So let's go ahead and refresh. And it says woof woof says the dog named doggo. And so that's working perfectly. Now what happens if we don't set that name? Currently this dot name does not exist. Let's go ahead and refresh our page. It says woof woof says the dog name undefined. Now if we wanted to, we could get into defaults. We could say something like if this dot name is equal to equal to equal to undefined, this dot name is equal to unnamed poppers. Let's save that and refresh. And it says woof woof says the dog named unnamed puppers. But if we go back here and we set thing dot set name doggo mcdogface oh mcdogface it says woof woof says the dog named doggo mcdogface. And so what it's doing here is it's setting that name. It says this dot name. Now if that name wasn't set, it's saying if this name does not exist in this particular object, in this class, set it. Otherwise, it's going to be set because we use set name and it does exist. Then use that one. So this is a nice little fallback. You can always use something like this. Now there is a better way of doing this. We're going to learn it in the next lesson. What I would like you to do is basically this. I want you to write a brand new class, write it out by hand. Remember, it starts with the keyword class, then it takes some sort of class name, then curly braces. And then we can put a function in here. Or because it's in a class, we technically call it a method. It is an object literal, so it's going to have the function name of set name, but also the property of set name. It can take a parameter just like a regular function can. And we use this.name is equal to name so that we can access this somewhere else in a different function without explicitly having to pass it in to this particular function every single time. We can shortcut it. So this is now accessible through this entire object. Name is accessible in this entire object. Next, you're going to need to do const whatever your variable is going to be called, new class name. And then you can use your variable name, dot set name, and dot speak. Go ahead and give that a shot. When you are nice and ready, when you have a little bit of experience with that, let's head on over to the next lesson where we set automatic defaults for our class. In the last lesson, we used set name, but we can actually do this by default with a class method called a constructor. And this is a big feature and a big win for JavaScript classes. And we just don't get this with standard objects. And this is where classes start to outpace objects. So let's say we have a class and it's called person. And in the last lesson we did set name, name, this dot name is equal to name, right? But then we had to do const p is equal to new person. And then we had to do p dot set name, Caleb. And that just, it gets easier. So like why do it the hard way when we can do it the easy way? So let's go ahead and get rid of this and that and that. 
And we have this magic method called constructor. And this can take any sort of parameter. So we could say the constructor takes a name, and then we say this dot, this dot name is equal to name. And then we can have a normal function in here called greeting. This is an object literal, and we can simply say console.log hello from, and this is a template literal, so we use backticks, this.name. And what constructor does here is we can say const Caleb is equal to new person, and that name is going to be Caleb. And that's automatically going to set this name. So before we had to do dot set name and we had to run a bunch of stuff, we don't have to do that anymore. We can just pass it in directly into our class. And now we can do Caleb.greeting, and this is already going to be set. This dot name is equal to Caleb. So it's like putting Caleb in here, which then sets it here, which then sets it here. And this seems really absurd. I know that <laughs> when you're learning, learning classes, this seems really bizarre, but it's powerful because you can write any number of functions down the road and you don't have to put name in here. You don't have to put name in every single one. You can just use this dot name anywhere you want. So it shortcuts it. Let's save that. And let's refresh our page. And it says, hello from Caleb. What if I change that? Hello from Gully. Hello from Gully. Now, if we ever wanted to, and this is a little bit beyond the scope of the constructor lesson, but we could also say set name. And we could overwrite it. This dot name is equal to whatever the name is. So let's by default set the name to be Gully. And then we could say Caleb dot set name. I'm going to rename myself to Caleb and do Caleb.greeting once more. And this is what my code looks like. I'll just scoot that up into the middle of the screen. And so when I re refresh, it now says hello from Gully. I changed my name to Caleb, and, it, and when I reran Caleb.greeting, it said hello from Caleb. Now what I would like you to do as your project or your little bit of homework for this lesson is create a class with a constructor method in it. It should take a name, or it could take multiple parameters if you want it to take unlimited parameters. You can totally do that too. Set this dot, whatever the variable name is, and you're going to see that when I select this, it's highlighted in all three methods here. But if you just set the name, make sure you also set it when you type new person, and then that first parameter is going to be name. If you have a second parameter, second parameter, you would just give it a second param. And you'd need to do something with this because this is not going to be accessible in any of these other methods. You're going to need to do this dot second param is equal to second param. And that just makes this accessible this keyword in everywhere else. So I'm just going to undo that because I want to keep this nice and simple for you. And I want you to give this a shot. So set the name here and then write another method, another function that accesses it from the constructor. This is really good practice. You're going to see this kind of stuff in production style JavaScript all the time in professional JavaScript. So make sure you are familiar with this. You don't have to be a, a pro at it at this point, but you need to be somewhat familiar with how this works. So get some hands on experience with it right away. When you're done that, I'll see you in the next lesson. All right, welcome back. I hope you had some fun with classes. I hope that was actually a little bit hard. Uh, just so that your brain remembers it better. Uh, they're powerful, powerful things. They are better than objects. They can do so much more, and there is so much more, but we're not going to learn all about it in JavaScript 201 because it gets pretty advanced. But in this lesson, we're going to talk about JSON. And JSON, J-S-O-N, stands for JavaScript Object Notation. And it's basically just a thing some guy made up at some point in time, a long time ago, uh, to make sure that one particular language can talk to another particular coding language. So JSON is a lightweight data interchange format. And that means I can write a particular type of JSON in JavaScript or in Python or in PHP, and it's going to be readable. And so even if my Node.js server can't talk to my Python server, I can send out JSON data that my Python server can then ingest or I can take in and understand what's going on.
So it's a globally recognized way to write code or to share data. So JSON is language independent. It doesn't really matter if it's JavaScript or Python or PHP or C or Java or Ruby or anything like that. And the idea behind JSON is it's supposed to be self-describing and easy to understand. Now it's easiest to learn JSON by simply looking at it. So let's create a new file. Now let's do a JavaScript file. And we're going to have some sort of object. So const object. And in here we could have name Caleb. Fave Foods is an array of pizza, tacos, I don't know, salmon. And we can have age 31. And we can make this object even more complex. We could say children. And this could be an array of objects in here. Name is equal to Zephyr. He's actually a cat. And his age is going to be four. And another one in here. This name is going to be Gully. He's also a cat. I'm not entirely sure what his age is. I'm going to guess four or five. Uh, and so we have this object here. And this is written in JavaScript. Now, the nice thing about learning JavaScript first, or at this point in time when you're getting into JSON, is that JSON is literally this. Let's go ahead and delete that. This is JSON. And so this, this is JSON. This is all it is. It looks like a JavaScript object. And as we know, objects can hold a property or a key and a value, or it can have a property and that value could be an array or a number or a Boolean or a list of more objects. This is all JavaScript is. And so whenever you're working with an API down the road, and for our main project here, we are going to be working with an ABI, an API that uses JSON, it's going to look a lot like this. And the idea is that we have some sort of data in here that we can access on another computer. So if they want to share data with us, that's basically what an API is, is when another computer decides that they're going to share data with us, we can then use that data in a globally recognized and unified way. So we don't have to worry about XML and, and writing our code to make sure that it always works with specific XML. We can just assume that everything is working nicely with JSON. And so Python can consume this nicely, PHP can consume this nicely, Node.js can consume this nicely, and in JavaScript, which is what Node.js is built on, this is basically just a standard object. No big deal. We've already learned about all of these pieces it's just, it doesn't have a variable. That's all it is. It's just plain text with a bunch of object data in it. And that is JSON. So when people say, oh, JSON is big and complex, they're wrong. It's not. It is literally just a JavaScript object. It just doesn't have a variable name. That's all it is. And so the idea here is that if I have this object, I can expose it on my web server and another server can consume it or JavaScript on someone's computer can consume it. And so we're going to be using this in our final project. At this point in time, there's nothing to do. We're going to get some hands-on experience with this in our project. Uh, but really, you just need to know that JSON is literally a JavaScript object. That's all it is. Let's talk about AJAX. Actually, it's not all caps anymore. It's just called AJAX. And so AJAX stands for async rowness make sure I don't typo that I'm not even sure if I did or didn't JavaScript and XML and so Ajax itself is actually not a programming language Ajax is a combination of a browser's built-in XML HTTP request so I'm saying XML HTTP request request object and that is the simplest way that your browser can send data to a server and accept data from a server and so whenever you like a post or whenever you like a photo on Instagram or whenever you tweet something or you're, you're on Twitter and it automatically reloads your tweets for you or you scroll down on Instagram and it just keeps on loading more and more images, that is an Ajax request. And so basically you can send this tiny amount of data to a server asking for more data. And that server can then send back usually a JSON object, which is what we learned about in the last lesson, and then JavaScript can parse that data, turn it into JavaScript objects or JavaScript arrays, and loop through the data in there 
and add more to your document object model, add more HTML to your page dynamically. And that is powerful because now you don't need to reload your page. You don't need to click load more and wait for the page to load. You don't need to go to page two or page three. You can just keep scrolling and it'll just keep loading more and more data for you. Assuming there's data to load, that is. Now, the nice thing is it's super light weight, super lightweight. And that's because it only needs to send a tiny bit of data and only needs to accept a tiny bit of data. So when you make a standard web request, your browser is going to go to www.facebook.com and it's going to ask for all sorts of things. It's going to ask for a CSS file. It's going to ask for HTML. It's going to ask for JavaScript. It's going to ask for images. It's going to ask for all sorts of endless things. With an Ajax request, it is simply sending a small little request and saying, hey, pst, Facebook, can I have just a little bit more information? And then Facebook says, yeah, okay, you can have some more information through their API. And they send back JSON or Instagram will send back JSON or really most APIs these days will send back JSON. And instead of sending back CSS files, which you've already loaded, or HTML, which you can write dynamically with JavaScript, or even loading more JavaScript because it's already been loaded once, it can literally just send you the JSON data, just raw data. It doesn't need to give you all that extra stuff. And so it loads super fast. So we used to use these things called XML HTTP request objects to make these types of Ajax requests. But nowadays we don't need to do that. We don't need to do that. We can just ignore that. And instead we're going to use this thing called the fetch API, which makes it significantly easier. There's no try catch involved, which we used to have to write. We don't have to worry about dealing with internet explorer. We can just straight up use fetch. And that is the function that we're going to get into in the next lesson. All right, in the last two lessons, we learned about JSON and we learned about the fetch API and what Ajax is. And in this lesson, we're going to actually write a little bit of Ajax and we're going to get some information from a website. So we're going to use the fetch API and that's because it's the new way of making Ajax requests. It handles things for us so that we don't need to, which is really nice. We don't have to write as much code basically and less code is always more. That's why we're not learning the old way of Ajax requests. It's old, it's outdated. We don't need to do it anymore. Instead, we're going to be learning fetch. So with fetch, it looks a lot like this. Fetch HTTP website.com does something, then does some more stuff in here, then does some more stuff in here. That's really all there is to a fetch request. And so we're saying, go and get information from website.com. Now we're gonna use a proper example here, but this is what the syntax looks like. And you'll notice that I'm using an indent here because I don't necessarily want it to look like this. This looks a little harder to read. And because it's actually part of the then keyword or the then method is part of the fetch function, I'm going to indent it so it looks nicer so that I know when I'm reading fetch, the next line when it's indented is also part of this fetch. So what I'm going to do is I'm just gonna open up my browser and I'm gonna to go to swappy.dev. And this is where we can get some Star Wars information, just an API for Star Wars. There's another one, if you don't like Star Wars, you can do Pokemon API. And this is pokeapi.co. It's pretty much the exact same thing, uh, slightly different URLs, but will give you very, very similar data. So if you're feeling like you'd rather do Pokemon stuff than Star Wars stuff, uh, just swap out uh, swappy.dev for pokeapi.co. The data is going to be slightly different. It's going to be structured slightly different. So you're gonna to have to handle that on your own which is a good upgrade project, by the way. But for now, we're going to be using swappy.dev. And the idea here is that we can simply type in swappy.dev slash API slash planets slash three. And that's going to give us Yavin four or people slash one. And this is going to give us Luke Skywalker. And so we can actually go to this URL and let's do this API slash people slash one. And you can see it's giving us all sorts of information. Oh, there's links in here that we can't really see, uh, but it's giving us all sorts of information. And if you take a look at this, doesn't this look a lot like JSON? Interesting, because it is JSON. And isn't it, isn't it interesting that it already looks like a JavaScript object? That's amazing. We've got arrays in here. We've got an empty array. We've got regular strings. 
We have mass and height, which honestly should be numbers, but they are coming in as strings as well, which is totally fine. We can work with that. We know how to cast a string to a number and work with that as well. So we want to use this URL and get some information about our friend Luke Skywalker. So what I can do here is fetch, and I'm just going to paste that URL in here. Then I'm going to take that response and I'm going to JSONify it. So response.json, and this is using arrow functions. We're familiar with these already. This is a short way of writing a one line arrow function. Then we can take that response and we can call it anything we want at this point. Let's just call it data. And let's go ahead and use a regular arrow function here and do console.log data. Now let's go back to our primary document and let's just refresh our console here. And you can see it, it takes a second to, to kick in there. It's not as fast as it usually is. And that's because it's asking another server for information but it is still pretty fast. And so we now have this object in here that has the birth year, eye color, hair color, name, starships, vehicles, uh, even has all the films that he's in, which are more API links, which we could go and get information from. This is how we make a simple fetch request. So what I would like you to do is create a simple fetch request. Now you can use the Star Wars API or you can use the Pokemon API or you can use really any other API as long as you, as long as you have access to that JSON. And just remember, we're going to fetch that URL. We're then going to take that response and turn it into JSON with response.json. Then we're going to take that data, which is basically the response.json. We're going to take that data and we're going to console log that data. And that's all we're going to do at this point in time. Once you have that console logging in your console, let's head on over to our final project where we create a way for our page to randomly load character from swappy.dev.